All right, let's take a look at our ideal gas law. Previously, we've learned about Boyle's law, Charles' law, Gay-Lussac's law, and when all three of those were combined, we got the combined gas law. And then we looked at Avogadro's law, which was talking about moles and volume. When you put both the combined gas law and Avogadro's law together, you get the ideal gas law. Now, before we get into the formula for the ideal gas law, let's learn about what an ideal gas is. So first of all, the ideal gas is a hypothetical gas, right? So it's not actually a real gas, but it helps us. This assumption, this behavior, this idea of an ideal gas will help us explain behavior for gases as we see them behave day, in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So a hypothetical gas is composed of particles that have no volume, they travel in straight lines and have no attraction to each other. All of this is describing our ideal gas. They have no intermolecular forces. Now, deviations from the gas laws occurs because ideal gases do not really exist, right? Like I was talking about, completely hypothetical gas. Experimentally, we are working with real gases. So under ordinary conditions, the differences between an ideal gas and a real gas are very, very insignificant, right? And because these differences are so minute, we are able to use these ideal gas calculations and apply them to real life gas behavior. Now, this isn't always true. Under really high pressure and low temperatures, real gases do not behave ideally, right? And the reason for this is because these molecules under high pressure and low temperature are much closer to each other. And because of this, they are able to form attractions with each other. Right? So our initial assumption of there being no attraction between the particles is not no longer true. And under low temperatures, there's very low kinetic energy of those particles, which means that they are much more likely to form those attractions with each other. Now, some important characteristics of real gases. So molecules of real gases have their own volume. They do have attraction and they do not necessarily move in straight lines as well as their collisions are not completely elastic, right? So it's important for us to understand that although an ideal gas is a hypothetical gas, because of the similarities in the behavior between real gases and ideal gases in most ordinary conditions, we are able to use these calculations to accurately explain how real gases behave. So now let's get into our formula. So the formula for an ideal gas law as I said earlier, is a combination of the combined gas law as well as Avogadro's law, right? So our combined gas law involved pressure, volume, temperature, whereas our Avogadro's law brought in moles to that as well. So when we put it all together, we have the formula PV is equal to NRT. And P is, stands for pressure, V for volume, N for moles, and T for temperature. Now I do realize I haven't talked about R yet. I'll come back to R after I go through the units for each of these other variables. So pressure, most often we're gonna see in kilopascals, volume in liter, moles in moles, and temperature in Kelvin. So now that we've done talking about what all of the other variables are and what their units are going to be, we can talk about R. R is what we call a constant. And R is a value that always stays the same. This number, which I'll get to you in a second, allows for this um, equation to explain how gases behave. So in order for us to figure out what the units for R are, R, R, let's rearrange this formula. If I were to just isolate for R, my formula is going to be PV over NT. And the units for each of these are, so the units for pressure, kilopascal, units for volume, liters, for moles, 
as well as for temperature, which is Kelvin. Now, in truth, the R value is completely dependent on kilopascal. So there's a few different options for R. So depending on the unit for pressure, the R value changes. For our course, we're going to only use the R value when the pressure is in kilopascals, right? So the R value is 8.314. This R value, this is the number and this is the unit for this entire R value is the one that we are going to be using for our purposes for this week. So this value does not change. Everything else could be different, but the R value is constant. So let's take a look at an example on how to solve an equation using the ideal gas law. So in this particular question, they're asking us to find the volume. So V is equal to question mark. Um, and they're giving us the mass. So mass is equal to 100.0 grams of oxygen gas at standard ambient temperature and pressure. Now, they're not telling me exactly what standard ambient temperature and pressure are, but because I know that standard ambient temperature gives me a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. And of course, I'm going to convert that to Kelvin right away. So 25 plus 273 Kelvin will give me 298 Kelvin. And pressure is 100.0 kilopascal. Now, if I take a look at my ideal gas law formula, PV is equal to NRT, let's take a look at all that I've accounted for. So I know my pressure, I'm trying to solve for volume, I've got the temperature, I know the value of R, again, because this is in kilopascal, I can use 8.314, and I don't know the moles yet, but given that I've been provided with the mass of O2, and I know the molar mass of O2, I can easily find the moles, right? So if I have 100 grams of O2, I can use my molar mass, so 32 grams of O2 for every one mole of O2 to solve for the moles. So now my grams will cancel out. And when I type this into a calculator, I'm going to get 3.125 moles of O2. So I know my value of moles then too. So I'm going to rearrange this formula so that I have to solve for volume. So volume is equal to, I need to move this P to the other side. Right now it's being multiplied. It needs to be divided when it goes over to the other side. So NRT divided by P. So now all I would need to do is plug in all of my numbers. So volume is equal to number of moles I know that that is 3.125 moles times the value of R, 8.314, of course, including all of my units. So remember that the units for R are kilopascal times volume, which is in liters, divided by moles times Kelvin, and that is my entire R value. Remember, if this was not in kilopascals, I had to first convert this to kilopascals so that I can use this R, right? But because this is already good, I don't need to worry about that. My temperature is 298 Kelvin divided by the pressure, which is 100.0 kilopascal, right? Let's see if our units check out. So my moles will cancel out, my Kelvin will cancel out, kilopascals will cancel out. The only thing that I will have left over is the liters, which makes sense because I'm solving for the volume. So when I type all of this into my calculator, 3.125 times 8.314 times 298 divided by 100.0, I get a number that is 77.424. And because I am using three sig figs, my number is going to be 77.4 liters. So that's how you'd use ideal gas law to solve a, a question like this.